This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hello and welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have got a very special episode for all of the crypto nerds out there. Um, when I started with Bitcoin, I was reminded of Arthur C. Clarke's statement that any sufficiently advanced technology is essentially indistinguishable from magic. I saw Bitcoin and I thought this is technology that fits that bill. It's a huge organization without an hierarchy. It's a, it's a, a global financial system and it's an immutable ledger. That was something very special that I found in Bitcoin when I started. Uh, about a year into my journey in understanding Bitcoin, I came across this other technology that which I also for which I also had the feeling that this is sufficiently advanced that is indistinguishable from magic. And that was the technology of ZK Snarks. Now, you might have heard of this name. It is uh, the upcoming currency Zcash or Zero Cash is based on this. And it's, it's going to be a currency that preserves uh, fungibility by being uh, completely private, private and anonymous. So today we are joined by Professor Eli Ben Sasson from, uh, from Technion. He's a professor there. And we are going to talk about some of the basic principles of zero knowledge proofs and cryptography that allows zero cash to be built. So we are going to talk about the fundamental constructs today followed by an episode on zero cash in the future. But before we get started, let's first have an introduction from you, Prof. Uh, Eli. Could you give us your introduction? Yes, yeah, so hello, uh, my name is uh, Eli Ben Sasson. I'm a professor at uh, Technion, Israel Institute of Technology at Haifa, Israel. Um, and I do my research there mostly on math and the um, theory of computation. And um, I also try to apply it in the context of various proof systems, um, such as um, ZK Snarks. So, so how, how did you become interested in, in this area? And what is the, the kind of importance of, of ZK Snarks? OK, so uh, proof systems in general, um, are well known within the theoretical computer science community to be, as uh, Mihail just uh, described it, some of the most amazing magic that, that came about in the past um, 30 or 40 years in computer science. And like many other colleagues of mine, I got attracted to this field and wanted to understand the mathematics and you know the implications and how do you build these things, how do you analyze them and what are their you know, attributes and limitations. That's how I got into it uh, some 15 years ago. So what is a proof system? Okay, so uh, a mathematical proof, as you might learn it in a course in mathematical logic, is just a string of bits that describes a proof. Um, a little bit just like a computer program is a string of bits that describes a computation. Now, the amazing um, discovery that started in the late 1980s um, called interactive proofs is that you can get almost the same mathematical rigor in a much more efficient way if instead of asking for a full you know, proof as in a textbook in mathematics, you are willing to undergo um, the sort of proof um, mechanism that we see in courts of law where you know there's a defendant or a prover in this case that wants to prove a statement and there's a verifier that you could think of him as the counselor or what's it called the the advocate that tries to query and question the prover um, and the goal is to find out whether the statement is true so in an interactive proof there is back and forth between prover and verifier and it's all in the purpose of proving uh, or checking whether a statement is true and the amazing thing is that you can get proofs 
of any statements in a very efficient manner that's much shorter than the classical mathematical way in this sort of courtroom style interactive proof system. Okay, that, that's very interesting. So, so normally one would have to provide a, a lot of data, for example, so to, to prove that a certain thing, uh, computation was executed, for example, Whereas with an interactive proof, you you could have someone question you, and does does that mean it's like probabilistic? Does that mean like I'm gonna ask uh, you know a random set of questions, and you know I'm gonna get it right ninety nine point nine percent of the time, or or do you get the same kind of certainty as if the other party gives you the entire proof? Great question. So you don't have absolute mathematical certainty with an interactive proof. That's something you have to, um, you know, uh, throw away. So you don't have absolute certainty. You only have probabilistic certainty, but you could get that probability to be as close as you want to, um, to, to one. And you do use randomness in order to, um, facilitate this whole process. And also it's very important that there's interaction between the two parties. Um, so those are the three ingredients. You use randomness, you have some probability of error. It's not a 100% proof, uh, you know, um, mathematical proof, but it's as high probability as you, you know, are willing to accept. And um, you need to use, um, yeah, randomness, interaction, and there is a probability of error. What you gain is is amazing efficiency. So, uh, so for our for our listeners, um, like right here, when we when we use the word proof, um, what you can think of mentally is kind of some of the proofs that you used to do when you were in school, which are mathematical proofs. But you must also remember that a lot of um, financial, a lot of financial transactions or financial. Uh, data can be also written in the form of proofs. For example, uh, what, what just bear this in mind that the word proof is, is, is a very broad thing, I think here, and it could include something like proof of owning 100 bitcoins, for example, that is also a proof, right, Professor? Yes, whenever a computation is executed and reaches a result, any computation, any computer program that you run that got an input, ran, 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 and then produced an output, you could think of it as a statement. The statement is, from the input, I ran this computer program and got that output. That is a mathematical statement. It's a very general mathematical statement and one that captures many, many things. You know, these computations could be any computer program, and each one of them forms a statement. And now we can prove these statements um, about any computer program being executed correctly. Um, exactly. So you can apply it to financial statements. You can apply it to statements about um, healthcare. You can uh, apply it to statements or computations that are related to law enforcement. Uh, you name it. Anything that a computer executes, you could get a statement out of it that you can now prove uh, using all kinds of um, cryptographic proof systems. So in, in this case, um... It, to, to verify a proof, does that mean that the, the party that's verifying it have, has to have, uh, you know, all the input data that went into that function? The answer is yes, but you could uh, sometimes have a cryptographic reference to that input data. For instance, maybe there's a large input file that needs to be, you know, used by the, by the computation, but to make things succinct, you could run a different program that gets only a hash of that data file. And now the execution is relevant to the hash of the file. So you could cryptographically compress inputs to make them very succinct. Um, but in, at the end of the day, um, one has to start with a particular um, explicit input and reach an explicit output and then there's all sorts of auxiliary inputs that maybe you want to hide them using things like zero knowledge proofs. So you start with some input, you reach some output, and in the middle you may use all kinds of auxiliary inputs that you don't want to be revealed. So revealing inputs and outputs is an option. It's not a something that you must do, but it depends on the statement. 
for instance, let me give an example. I can prove, you know, someone owns owns a Bitcoin. Okay, you know, I, I won't tell you anything about, let's say, the the um, any transaction or any pointer to any uh, Bitcoin blockchain. I could just prove to you there exists some some Bitcoin owned by someone. Well, okay, that's a statement that I can prove, but in the context of a financial transaction, that probably is something you don't care about. What you care is you want to know that I own a Bitcoin, that I know of a Bitcoin transaction. And when 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 you want me to say that to you, you want to see what is you know some indicator of that Bitcoin transaction. So you would want to see some input. So so for example, like like let's uh, let's let's take this one example and then uh, then go through what kinds of proofs there are. So the simple example I want to take is uh, like in 2014, uh, Bitstamp the exchange uh, did a proof of solvency. So they wanted to prove to the world that they owned around I don't know what it was around a hundred thousand bitcoins or something. The way they did that is they called Mike Hearn. Yes, Mike Hearn. <laughs> And Mike Hearn came, uh, he physically went to Bitstamp and um, he actually verified that uh, what which outputs Bitstamp is claiming, claiming as their own. And the, he had Bitstamp sign messages with private keys corresponding to those unspent outputs. So, you know, maybe there's like, you know, 100 outputs in the Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin was uh, Bitstamp was claiming, okay, I I own these outputs and I have the private keys. So if if you imagine me as Bitstamp, I'm trying to say that. And then there's Brian who is like Mike Hearn, and he comes to me and he says, okay, if you want to prove that you own these hundred thousand bitcoins, these hundred outputs, then get those private keys, take this message from me, and sign all of sign this message by all of these different private keys. Then I go and sign. And I send those signatures to Brian and Brian can check those signatures and say, okay, I agree that you have a hundred thousand Bitcoins spread over these hundred different outputs, right? So this was done in 2014. Um, now for this, what's, what's, what's relevant is we needed a human, like we needed Brian to be there verifying it. Now, what you're saying, professor, essentially is this, this whole process could be automated by having let's imagining an ideal program what that ideal program does is it takes inputs the private keys that bitstamp has uh, goes to the bitcoin blockchain checks how many bitcoins corresponding to these outputs it has and then it outputs the value of the total number of bitcoins controlled by bitstamp so the input is the private keys there's a program and then the output is how many bitcoins does the person who gave the input have right and now what you're saying is bitcoin a bitstamp can run this program on their end and generate a proof that somebody else could verify on their side and they doesn't and he doesn't need to be physically in with, with bitstamp or communicating with bitstamp precisely yes and um these private keys would would be what we would call in our papers and talks auxiliary inputs or a non-deterministic witness to take a more technical term so the, the private keys that are used to sign these various messages are data that you do not want revealed you just want to prove that you know it its existence so this would be auxiliary input to our computation this non-deterministic witness that proves knowledge of, of the, the keys that control these 100 coins. And the statement then is, the statement being proved is, there exist 100 keys, there exist 100 keys, no one is revealing them, such that you know, if they are plugged into the signing and uh, verification of signatures algorithm, all of them you know are correct and uh, the total sum of them is whatever a thousand coins so the statement is someone executed the program and this program output the value a thousand coins and that program is the one we just described the one that checks signatures and then sums up the amount of, of value in the coins perfect yeah that, that's very interesting now just to take a little step back, the term snarks, uh, 
uh, there's, so there's the term snarks, right? There's the term ZK snarks, like zero knowledge snarks. And then they are the, there's also the term zero knowledge proofs. Can you briefly explain like what exactly each of those are and, and how they are related? Yeah, um, I think there is a, an abundance of, of terms that talk about very similar things. And um, um, so zero knowledge, there are, okay, zero knowledge, there are a lot of zero knowledge protocols out there, okay, theoretical and a few are um, implemented. And uh, there are several different names for them. Sometimes some of them are called computationally sound proofs, and sometimes it's non-interactive zero knowledge. And there's snarks and snarks, and uh, I'm sure there are a few other um, proofs of delegation of computation. Various different names for things that are somewhat similar. Um, so zero knowledge means that informally means that the auxiliary inputs that are involved in the computation, all these keys and stuff that is not explicitly, um, you know, produced as an output of the computer program, um, all this information is, is hidden and kept private. That's the informal description. There is also a formal definition that is a little bit more involved than I don't want to get into. So there are many, many different ways to get zero knowledge proofs. And then there are many, many flavors of zero knowledge proofs according to what cryptographic assumptions are used and what kind of zero, zero knowledge comes in several variants. There's statistical and computational and perfect and in all kinds of models. And I think that as you go into different models and different setup assumptions for these systems, you get various terms that um, I'm not sure. I mean, the distinction between the various flavors is not something that the general public, you know, would want to go into necessarily. <laughs> okay, no, no, that's that's perfectly fine, and that, that that's also a good answer. So we, we can know we can sort of all lump them together, and and we can we can know what we're talking about. Yeah, non cryptographers, I think you know, calling them either zk proofs or um, snarks or uh, you know there are other names for them. Uh, I like to call them skip succinct computational integrity and privacy proofs, but you know, every, there are similar variants of uh, the same big phenomenon of an interactive proof that is zero knowledge and uh, you know, proves that a computation executed correctly. Let's take a short break and talk about Hi.me. Hi.me is a VPN provider. And if you don't know yet why you should need a VPN provider, let us help you. I'm sure you were like me, and when all the crazy revelations came out during the Snowden time uh, of all the, the spying that is being done by the NSA and other government agencies, you were shocked and you said, not with me, not with my own rights. Now, the way government agencies can spy on you, there's many of them, but the most easiest way is by simply going to your ISP and getting all your traffic, capturing all your traffic. And a VPN can protect you from that. It can give you a secure tunnel from your computer to any of the exit nodes all over the world so that all your traffic goes to this secure pipe that's encrypted and cannot be intruded on. And with Hike.me, you can choose any of their, their 30 exit nodes all over the world so you can enter the internet in a secure location. The best thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan, which includes two gigabytes of unthrottled bandwidth per month. So you can go to Hide.me slash Epicenter to create your free account. And when you use that URL, you'll automatically get 35% off if ever you decide to go premium. Now the premium plans are really great. They include unlimited bandwidth, access to all of the 30 exit nodes that Hide.me provides, and you can install it on up to five devices at a time. So you can have this running on your phone, your tablet, your computer at work, your personal computer, and just be completely protected all the time. And of course, Hide.me accepts Bitcoin. So we'd like to thank Hide.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So in this case, like, uh, like when you're saying zero knowledge, if you map it to the Bitstamp example, the zero knowledge part is that when Bitstamp is trying to prove that it owns 100,000 coins, it has some knowledge. The knowledge is basically private keys that 
unlock these different coins on the Bitcoin network, that is Bitstamp's knowledge. And then if I am a verifier of Bitstamp, I want to verify that they actually have this thing, then uh, it is in Bitstamp's interest to not reveal any of these keys to me. They want to prove that they own 100,000 coins, but they don't want to reveal any of these keys because I can steal those I can steal those funds if I knew the keys. So zero knowledge here means that they can send me a proof that they own 100,000 coins while also not revealing their knowledge, which is the private, which is the private key. So zero knowledge basically uh, is, is a reflection of that, that they can keep their private keys and their knowledge secret, but yet prove something to me about what about the nature of the knowledge that they have. Yeah. So um, I, 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 I try to explain it this way. If I make a statement like I own a thousand bitcoins, you're already getting knowledge. Now you know that I own a thousand bitcoins. Okay. Now we, and you gain some knowledge from that. Now we start interacting where I send you various strings of bits and you ask me certain queries and I send you information back. And the question now is at the end of this extra process, after you heard the statement, what have you learned? And in the zero knowledge proof, there's a formal way of stating that you learned nothing. You learned as much as if you would have asked me, you know, your questions and I would just answer with, uh, you know, zero, 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 like, you know, some r completely random string. That's the informal interpretation of a zero knowledge proof where you learn what you learn from the statement, but the whole interactive or non-interactive or everything extra, everything appearing in the proof or in the snark or in this extra information is meaningless to you from a crypt cryptographical point of view. It's just as, as tossing, you know, a few coins and using that thing. What do you learn from that extra about, you know, do you learn anything? If I just toss a few coins and, and tell you the answers, will you learn something about the keys that control my 100 Bitcoins? No. So that's the informal explanation of what it means for a proof to be zero knowledge. It conveys no information beyond the veracity of the statement. So anything you can learn, you will have learned from the statement itself, not from the proof. So if you if you look at the, the Bitstamp example, like there, so who are exactly the actors and the participants in these things? So is there just Bitstamp on the one hand that would you know do this proof and then supply it to some verifier who would then um, I guess either run the proof entirely or they would be interacting with them. So that those would be two different cases. Or is that right? Okay, so um, a lot of work has gone into, so we started talking about interactive proofs, that there is a back and forth and it's really crucial um, to get you know these savings in, in running time and all the amazing properties, you really need the interaction. But then people, you know, asked, okay, can we sort of minimize this interaction or make it really, really simple? And 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 the amazing answer is yes, you could do various things that will make the interaction very minimal to the point of only needing um, a setup phase that is so it's like a three message protocol, or actually just a two message protocol. There's a setup phase where some you know queries if you will are um broadcasted and then after that everything is non-interactive so after that there's just a prover um using the information that came from the setup phase and using it to cook up proofs and you know sending them or broadcasting them outside to the outside world and then anyone can at their leisure at their leisure, um, you know, check these proofs. So there still is interaction, but it's a very minimal kind of interaction. I mean, formally, there's a very small number of rounds of interaction. There's one publishing of, um, you know, setup parameters. And then beyond that, there's only the prover sending proofs along with the statements being proved. So it still is interactive, but, um, you know, very minimal interaction. So like uh, like in this podcast, uh, before we jumped into this example, you were going through 
this uh, you're telling this telling the story about in the 80s you had interactive proofs and now you have these zk snarks and the key takeaway is, like i'd like to ask if this guy the key takeaway is in in the 80s if if there existed bit stamp and it wanted to prove me this thing in the 80s then the we would have to exchange a lot of messages right i send i send him a query he replies i send him again he replies and maybe after a, a thousand rounds i am convinced that okay this this guy actually has a thousand bitcoins what has happened over it was 25 years is i don't need to keep on sending these queries receiving replies in order to no i can basically the bit stamp can j- just generate a string send it to me and i can read that string and verify that this is true that is the advance um not exactly so i think it's just uh, it's more that um you know theory progresses very quickly and there's usually in in advanced science a few decades um go by between an initial idea and even its uh, implications and various improvements on it and you know technology making its way into the real world this happens all the time in computer science for instance error correcting codes were started to be you know devised in the 40s and you know various other advanced codes were then devised in in the 60s and it takes really like 2 to 3 decades for those things to show up inside actual systems even if uh, you know the things that show up in the end are pretty much known at the start so now to answer this particular question if you asked a theoretician in the early 90s you know if we wanted to do this um um this computation that you just did do i need a lot of rounds of interaction and so on and so forth the answer would have been theoretically not you know you know you have very um very very good systems theoretical ones that work uh, really extremely well have an even better setup we'll get to the setup um process later and then you know the trust assumptions um so even better things were known in the 1980s in 1990s but converting them into practice i mean a lot of the initial theoretical um um constructions were extremely inefficient from a practical point of view so again to sum up in the early 90s there were very good answers that gave already non interactive zero knowledge proof systems that had asymptotically and theoretically pretty much the same performance as the snarks that showed up only recently but um the constructions were not efficient enough to be um done in practice now i should say it's not that research is not advanced i want to um um so so the, the the currently published version of snarks that's out there that zero cash uses and others um did benefit from several beautiful recent results that said something like this because uh, these early constructions are a little bit too inefficient these constructions based on probabilistically checkable proofs let's use additively homomorphic encryption to bypass the problematic parts and additively homomorphic encryption is something that's been around for some time but this idea to use additively homomorphic encryption to speed up um the way you use probabilistically checkable proofs is a relatively new idea it started in 2007 in the work of two of my peers at technion uh, yuvali shay and eyal kushilevits and uh, a researcher from um ucla uh, rafael ostrovsky and in this beautiful paper um they said you know if we use additively homomorphic encryption we could speed up and circumvent uh, various technicalities in previous um attempts and this led to a long sequence of works that culminated in a beautiful construction by uh, Gentry Gennaro um Parno and and Rekova that uses something that introduced something called quadratic span programs and quadratic arithmetic programs that really became quite efficient and they are the theoretical basis of the currently implemented systems the two i think most adopted ones are pinocchio and libsnark so again in the 90s they knew to do really amazing things theoretically constructions were inefficient 2007 
a uh, marvelous breakthrough said, let's use additively homomorphic encryption to bypass certain technicalities. That thing has led to very rapid progress that led to these systems uh, that we use today. Um, I should mention that the old school kind of systems are still very much interesting and, you know, we're still working on getting them off the ground as well. Perhaps we could we could uh, so that's that's a very interesting history right that uh, that theoretically it was it was there for twenty years and now only it has started to become practical as in like an as an engineering solution to certain problems so we we will want to go into uh, what is the current state of implementation because a lot of our audience says are like programmers who might you know someday want to use these systems so um, you might want to know what's going on right now. But before that, perhaps we should go into uh, the setup phase. Like in your in your scenario, you said that there's there's this setup phase that is needed before, in our case, like Bitstamp can actually generate the proof. So what is the setup phase like? Okay, so the setup phase, I should say, um, and, and this goes back to you know the old systems versus the new systems. So in the old systems, the old theoretic theoretical systems that have not yet been um, reduced to practice. Um, in these old systems, the setup phase consisted of picking a very sh short random string and posting it. So for instance, practically speaking, you could take the first 256 digits of, of pi and say, this is, you know, this is the system setup. And from here on, it's non-interactive and everyone uses it. Okay. Um, but again, these systems have not yet been implemented. The newer systems that you would use additively homomorphic encryption have a more involved and uh, susceptible setup phase that you have to do really carefully. In this setup phase, um, the parties running it are going to use um, asymmetric encryption, so some forms of public key uh, cryptography to take um, some secret and cook up from it various queries. Remember, we talked about an interactive proof where uh, the advocate is going to ask, you know, the prover various questions. So, with the use of additively homomorphic encryption, um, you take those queries that you would want to ask later on and somehow encrypt them in advance in a way that the prover. The honest prover can answer them very easily and efficiently, but um, a prover who wants to prove a false statement will not, you know, efficiently be able to to answer this question. So this setup phase involves some secret that, if it is somehow leaked or revealed, um, you know, can ruin the system in the sense that knowing that secret, that trapdoor, would allow whoever knows it to, you know, forge pseudo proofs of, of any statement, true or false. So in the new systems, the ones implemented like LibSnark and Pinocchio and, and Hawk and Zero Cash, the setup phase is a really, really critical one, a really critical phase that has to be carried out right. And carried out right means that the party that runs it has to basically, you know, be unobserved and then destroy the computer or laptop or whatever it used to generate um, the initial um, part in the interactive proof. Okay, so 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 to rephrase that, like let's let's take the the, the bit snap example again, and now let's say that Mike Hearn, instead of going by there and looking at their computers and all, you know, he was gonna play that role, but using you know zero knowledge proofs. So let's say he he was participating in that setup phase uh, to to ask the, um, the the party interacting with Bitstamp. Does so that means he would have to have some secret, you know, key for the setup phase. But if he you know leaked that to anyone, then they could forge the proof. Is is that correct? That would work, but it's a little bit better. So suppose everyone knows the computation for checking uh, solvency, okay? It's a, it's a well-defined computation. So someone, it doesn't have to be my current, but someone trusted or some, you know, someone trusted by, by everyone should um, run the setup phase on behalf of everyone else 
and then you know publish to the world this is the key that everyone uses or the set of keys that everyone uses and then that person could you know disappear um now you don't there's no need for mike hearn or anyone else i mean everyone knows the computation everyone has the key to proving and the key to verifying it anyone can run this computation and you know that um th this company can run the computation and just generate the output along with the proof right but you still need that trusted party except that there's a different role for the trusted party and the trusted party doesn't have to verify the process doesn't have to verify the keys they just have to produce some secret and then not leak it right yeah they have to well they have they consume a certain secret which is you know just some random string and that random string is used to generate a um, a key that is revealed to everyone and the important thing is that the random string should be you know just destroyed because if it is leaked uh, it could be used to forge um it doesn't break zero knowledge but it could be used to to forge um statements uh, sorry proofs of any statement I, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, the researchers, including you, must have developed some kind of hardware or other systems that kind of give uh, high certainty uh, that uh, the secret has been destroyed. For example, let's say I I want to be uh, I want to do the setup phase professionally, right? Like my I want to make my profession just setting up uh, these zero knowledge systems and then destroying their secrets and then that's it and everyone can use it. And that's that's what I want to do, right? Now, now the world doesn't trust me, obviously, because uh, to the world, I'm just just a single guy in in a in a strange city they don't know of. Why would they trust me to 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 set set these systems up? So, uh, have ha have the has the community developed some kinds of methods by which a gen a set set up person like me could ensure the world that. The way I've set it up is actually right, and I've destroyed what needs to be destroyed. Uh, unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, no, I don't have a good answer for that. The best answer I have for that is so um, my colleagues and and I, in particular, uh, Professor Matt Green, uh, Alessandro Chiesa, um, Eran Trom, Eran Madars Virza. Last year, we published a paper showing how you can do multi-party, secure multi-party computation to amortize this uh, this uh, harmful secret, this trapdoor among several parties. So for instance, you know, um, we could all participate in this protocol and uh, what we proved in that paper is that if even one of us is, is honest in the sense that we actually do destroy um, our computer and don't reveal the secret, then even if the rest collude, the whole system is still secure. But this isn't, a, you know, this isn't the ultimate answer that should convince everyone that things are okay because some central agency maybe could listen, could eavesdrop on all our computers, or maybe, you know, maybe we will have a large enough incentive to actually, um, you know, reveal these, keep these secrets and, and combine them together, even if we do this multi-party computation protocol. So um, from a cryptographic point of view, I'm not aware yet of any research that shows how to, um, in this additively homomorphic encryption system, uh, make sure that there is no key that can be used. Now, where ca you can do this. The, the good news is that the good old systems, the ones that have not been implemented yet, don't have this problem at all. There is no trusted setup, period. You, 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 the first message is, practically speaking, I already you know, can tell it to you, it's the first 256 digits of pi. Or you know, pick any other random looking string that's probably good enough for practical purposes and there's nothing that any of us can do that I'm aware of that could break such a system. So there is hope beyond the horizon. It's just not yet uh, you know, ready for, practical use like zero cash okay that's that's interesting because i was going to say before well with the bitstamp example you know if you say like we don't want to trust mike Hearn to destroy that thing well maybe what one could do is just run it 
you know, five times, right? Five different people do it and then Bitstamp has to prove it for each one. But then what you're saying, right, is the even simpler way would be that sort of the five people together generate that secret. And then if even one of them is honest, then Bitstamp only has to verify it once and, and you have that same sort of security. Exactly. So that, it's, yeah. yeah. So what we proved is that if the secure multi-party computation protocol that we suggested is used, then it's enough that just one party used, uh, you know, destroyed the randomness that it put into the baking of this first message, this, these parameters that everyone uses afterwards. And again, ultimately, when it comes to systems like Zero Cash or, or Hawk or whatever other systems are built using um, the encryption-based SNARKs, uh, you would have to, I mean, users and customers would have to use their own discretion and decision about whether they trust the party or the process that generated um, the keys of the system to be uh, trustworthy. Because there is no cryptography in that flavor of systems that, that assures you that the key is okay. Today's magic word is proof, P-R-O-O-F. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So, uh, so in this in this world of the in, of the trusted, like let's call it the trusted uh, party snark, uh, what are kind of the performance implications of 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 doing something like this? Like, let us go back to the initial definition, which is like there's a program, there's some input to it, and there's some output, and I have a computer that's running this program, and I get an output and I want to prove to the world that the output actually matches this input and program. So I generate a snark. So what 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 performance penalty do I get? And then if I send you this proof and you want to verify this, what performance penalty do you have? So the trade-offs, uh, very roughly speaking, are that the prover pays a lot and the verifier pays very little or even uh, benefits because um, verification, you know, and the published um, snarks is around nine milliseconds is really, really fast for any length of computation. So theoretically, you could take a computation that would take even without proving it, you know, a year or something really ridiculously large and cook up um, its, its snark and still it would take only nine milliseconds to verify. Okay. Um, so verifier really, really gains a lot um, in or saves a lot. Now prover pays a lot. It's it's uh, it's much more time consuming to generate a proof uh, than just to run a computation. But of course you have to pay for um, you know being able to prove something. And um, I would say that currently, you know, within a few hours you could get a computation that's roughly something like um, let's say up to a million cycles of a simple uh, machine. That's roughly where we get stuck in terms of RAM consumption. So roughly a million comp million cycles or maybe, you know, 100,000 cycles, of some very simple machine that has, you know, small word size, some, some early version of an X286. Um, I mean, that's the kind of systems that we actually built and tested. So, for instance, zero cash, which puts our system pretty much uses it to its limit, uh, involves something like um, you know 128 invocations of SHA-256 plus a little bit of logic. So the big thing there is the number of invocations of SHA-256, and it will take you roughly an hour to produce a proof that you ran you know 128 invocations of SHA and did some minimal logic, you know, integer addition and stuff like that. Now, you, I mean, I'm sure that our Bitcoin audience viewers know that you can do SHA-256 SHA pretty quickly on modern computers. And I'm telling you that it, to prove that you executed it um, with a snark would be one hour for, you know, roughly 100 SHA. So that's right. What's the... Uh, rate of that it's it's pretty small but you know you get zero knowledge and you get proofs mm -hmm. 
so is is it that a constraint like if if i want to spend a zero cash in the future i want to spend a z cash coin does it mean i need to uh generate the proof that i have the coin and i am spending it correctly for i need one hour to do all of these computations so in the academic paper you know as an academic i would say yes you spend one hour i i know that the you know engineering team is looking at various things like getting this uh you know number down and i'm i think that when you'll talk to um Zuko, who's the CEO of Zcash, will probably be better suited to answer these kinds of questions. But um, I, everyone who knows computers knows that uh, anything that runs X now in an academic version, probably when it gets to production grade and after optimizations, is going to be much faster than X. So, uh, so can you walk us through the landscape of uh, landscape of systems that are available today and can be used? by like very good programmers to experiment with these technologies like you mentioned pinocchio and lipsna could you explain what else is there and what's the difference so i think the basic systems that i am aware of are pretty much these two pinocchio and libsnark uh, um, there may be differences in the um, licensing strategies which probably matters to a lot of Programmers, I know, I, I don't know about Pinocchio's. I know, you know, the license that that that's used there, but I'm sure it's it's, it's posted there somewhere. Ours is an MIT open source, you know, MIT standard license, so it's I think very welcoming to programmers, and it's available at Libsnark, uh, the GitHub repository. Um, additionally, those interested in playing with with other systems. Um, could could look at at Zcash that has its own GitHub that uses Libsnark and also um, already has an alpha testnet running. So and and you know that's another place to use um, to look at code and use it and play with it. Um, I am not aware enough of other basic systems that um, other than. Pinocchio and Libsnark, but you know, there's Google. <laughs> I know of Pinocchio and Libsnark, and I know of Zcash. I'm sure there must be others that already improved or forked, or but I'm not the right person to ask. We so we we mentioned zero cash, right? So that that would be one application to make basically something like Bitcoin, but you know, truly anonymous. What other applications? are there for that this kind of technology and then what are the ones that you are most interested in it's a very good question and it's one that's a little bit hard for me to answer because i'll explain why the things that interest me most are getting these things to be universal which means it's it's a little bit like building a compiler so whoever builds a compiler if you ask them you know what is the program that you would like most to compile i'm guessing they'll <laughs> say well you know all of them and you know i just want to build the compiler to be as good as possible so the mindset that, that that we have is often more or less like this. We first try to build universal systems that apply to any computer or to a large class of computer programs, and then you could look at applications. That's actually what happened with, with Libsnark. First, we published a bunch of papers about how you could get arbitrary C programs to compile into zero-knowledge uh, SNARKs, and then we optimized it and downscaled the uh, not, I mean, downscale the functionality to, uh, but also optimize the speed and efficiency to uh, build uh, zero cache. So any computer program, as long as it's not too many cycles, let's say a million cycles of some simple machine is probably where we top out right now, is a candidate. And I think the first things would be things within the financial domain. So smart contracts, you know, not just proving things about statements, but maybe, you know, that you pay taxes, that you, um, um, you know, that you comply to certain regulations. So certainly financial applications are really, really good for that. Let me say why, because they're very simple as a computer program. You know, this is not loading up boots, uh, bootstrapping the Linux kernel. It's just, uh, you know, addition and subtraction of, of integers, right? That's what money is about. And, um, these computations are really important. They have a lot of an a lot of economic incentive to them. That's another good thing about them. 
And uh, yeah, so they're really simple and as computations and they're really important. I think other domains where it may be interesting is of course security and cybersecurity, all kinds of things related to you know gateways and entry points to systems, improving system health. Uh, other things would be in the healthcare area and as I said, legal and government areas where you know privacy is really valued and important. Those are areas. But you know, when I go to the lab and, and talk to my peers, uh, what, what, what do we talk about? Not so much about the applications, about getting the systems more efficient, new, new functionalities and so on. So, so if you look at this from a higher level, would you, would you say that zero knowledge proofs are basically always valuable when someone wants to verify that the process is done in a certain way and that it's done correctly? without having access to some private data. Yes, that's why I like to call, uh, you know, that's why we called our, our lab Skipper Lab succinct, proofs are short, computational integrity. You want, you expect integrity from your computations. You want the output to be correct and privacy, succinct computational integrity and privacy research, Skipper Lab. That's, uh, yeah, that's how I would describe it. You want all computations to have their outputs produced with integrity without cheating correctly. Okay, that's great. And so that sort of ties into some of the, the areas you mentioned, right? So if you talk about finance or you mentioned that like, uh, for example, let's say some bank could prove that before every payment, they checked a certain database and the result they get back was, you know, the person's not a terrorist or... For example, with the tax authorities that they could prove certain things about maybe how the money was spent, like some sort of accountability to the public or or uh, auditing function could be interesting, right? So that, uh, so, okay, yeah. And, and what about the realities of this? I mean, do you, are you seeing uh, adoption? Yes. Okay. From my seat as a professor doing research, who before this only did, you know, only did math and proved theorems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see a lot of interest from, you know, people like you. I've never been interviewed about my work on propositional proof complexity and resolution. Yeah. And, you know, I've never been asked to be interviewed about it. And, uh, you know, those are results I'm very happy with. So <laughs> I, I'm joking here, but what I mean is I think there is adoption, but I'm also not the right person to ask because I'm not really, you know, a startup entrepreneur. I don't really know what the trends are. I think that from, as a scientist, I'm very excited to see that people outside, you know, the mathematical theoretical domain of computer scientists is actually interested in talking about this and hearing more. So yeah, that's a sign of adoption. Yeah, that's, that's really a sign of adoption. Perhaps it's, it's, it's just the nature of uh, like distributed uh, ledgers, like, you know, whether they be Bitcoin or the ledgers that people are building for banks. And we kind of see that this whole, our whole space, like A to Z, we are going to hit this big wall where uh, we, none of us have an answer for financial privacy. Like, um, like with Bitcoin, what happens is, uh, Generally, Bitcoiners are the people who care enough about having something independent of government to say, okay, I'm going to willing, I'm willing to potentially sacrifice my financial privacy to have this, to transact in this system that's not controlled by a government, but I'll be immune to things like the Greek crisis or the Brazilian crisis or whatever, right? And that's, that's kind of the person I am. But when, whenever, when, whenever you try to go and say that, okay, a bank should use a system like this, then you know, you get into a system situation where the banks already have give you financial privacy. And uh, why why should they move to another system which doesn't? So this is kind of our, this is the reason I think there's a lot of interest into this line of research because it, it seems one thing that can tie untie the Gordian knot really and uh, allow this tech, tech to go mainstream and, you know, careers to be made, etc. Yeah, I think that this this hits upon a point that's common to things like ZK Snarks and to Bitcoin, which is that these are technologies that are very much 
for decentralization and for you know the little guy out there and anti-establishment whereas a lot of the world and a lot of business is about trying to be that trusted party the portal you know the portal where everyone goes to the hub the central place that's how business succeeds and now the question is does business want or need something like this decentralized thing I would say that past experience is the internet. You know, the internet is something very decentralized, very distributed, and uh, it did spawn a lot of business, um, good business. It is always constantly under these pressures that make it more centralized. I'm sure some people would say it is already completely centralized and it's just one big scam. I don't know. I don't think that's the common view. So there are these forces of centralization and decentralization always going on in society. And Bitcoin, as I understand, undergoing one of those uh, spasms as we speak, right? You know, is it really decentralized anymore? Is it controlled by mining pools? I don't know. I'm not a Bitcoin expert. Um, I'm sure similar things can also apply and will apply to systems built on zero knowledge proofs and things like that. So, uh, so a, a, a few a few applications. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you're not the perfect person for this conversation, but I'd still want to pose a question anyway, uh, because I don't know who is to be honest. Um, like I, I have this feeling that um, zero knowledge proofs could uh, could help in scaling up things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like, let me let me walk you through my thought process and. Tell me if it's right or wrong. For example, in Ethereum, you have these smart contracts, right? And uh, like if I and Brian do a, do a smart contract, so there's a program in, in the middle of us that's mediating our financial relationship. That program needs to be checked by all of the nodes on the Ethereum network. So there might be like 6,000 of them. So it's one single computation repeated like 6,000 times across the network. Now... The simple question I kind of get in my mind is, this is a technology where computation can be repeated once, done once, and then checked 6,000 times that, you know, the result was correct or not. So it naturally seems something that could help like Ethereum scale, that you could delegate some of your computation to a specialized node, and that node does the computation and it generates a proof, and then all of the rest of the network just verifies that proof that allows massive scalability. Would, would you say this view is right? I would say that it's completely right, theoretically. And now practically, it remains to be seen. It's very challenging practically because, you know, taking this ballpark number of roughly we max out at a 128 shot to 56 uh, invocation. So if you take just even a single block with thousands of of SHA-256 and, you know, thousands of uh, ECDSA signatures, you know, we're not up to scale right now with that. So theoretically, yes, it could compress, you know, again, theoretically, you could take the whole history of the blockchain from the genesis till today and have a single 288-byte snark that attests to the fact that the, you know, you don't need to know anything, just that all these transactions till the very latest state is okay. Theoretically, practically, um, I think we're heading that way, but it will be a non-trivial scientific and then engineering challenge to actually compress, um, you know, practical things that could help in the scaling problem. But yes, I'm I'm very optimistic in the midterm and long term. In the short term, it's challenging scientific work that you know we're we're thinking about. So what's midterm, but in your definition, in your dictionary, what is midterm? Well, you know, a few years as opposed to many, many years. <laughs> and short, ter short term would be, you know, a few weeks and then midterm is, <laughs> I, I don't want to give any, you know, dates or, you know, any, any prophecies about when something may happen or not. It's sometime in the future. Uh, so perhaps like uh, before the show, me and Brian were talking about this technology and we were, we were having this discussion about how, uh, about how uh, like, like, like with Ethereum, you see that they have, you have smart contracts and with, uh, with zero knowledge, you could delegate this computation to a specialized node. But for Bitcoin also, we were, we were thinking of this other example where um, 
let's say like a miner creates a block and now the other nodes other miners in the network need to download this block verify it and then start building on top of it right and like if, if the block is extremely huge like if the block is like 100 MB so let's say a miner in like uh, Xinjiang province China generates this block that's 100 MBs now for that block if and I'm, I'm sitting in Iceland and I'm another miner for that 100 MB block to come to me is going to take 10 minutes or 12 minutes and in that time that miner in Xinjiang has, a, has an advantage over me because he knows the block and can build on it but I don't know the block and I don't build on it and I kind of lose out so um, so if you if you wanted to scale Bitcoin to a massive block size today, uh, uh, you would have mining centralization. Like if if Chinese miners are dominating, like they would communicate all the blocks to each other, and then you know they have an advantage over a miner like me in Iceland. Now uh, now with zk snacks, what we were thinking was like the miner in Xinjiang generates a block, and then generates a zk snack proof that says okay the accounting in this block is correct, and he just sends the block header like you know with the with the new merkle root and the new utx output says the block header and the proof to me in iceland and that's just maybe you know 1 mb or 2 mbs so that comes very quickly like in 500 milliseconds and i can also start building on it so uh, it allows the miner in iceland to stay on par with the with the miners in china and then actually bitcoin can scale the block size using this technology does that make sense Again, yes, I think it does. Theoretically, uh, practically, I don't think we're, you know, we're not yet in the hundreds of megabytes of or hundreds of millions of, of uh, uh, Bitcoin transactions. But yes, theoretically, I think that's, you know, something we would like to do at some point uh, when the technology is sufficiently efficient for that. Right. The question here, I guess, would also be how long does it take you to generate that proof, right? Because, of course, like that also delays how long it takes until you can send it out to the rest of the network. Yeah, precisely. So that's that's actually the only uh, that's the only um, um, bottleneck because length of proofs is very small. It's going to stay around 300 bytes for, for these ZK snarks and verifying them is nine milliseconds, irrespective of these 900, you know, uh, sorry, of this 100 megabyte. Uh, so, so it's really the only bottleneck has and always will be uh, on the prover side. And right now, you can't prove, um, you know, feasibly, right, w within our lifetime, uh, a block of 100 million um, transactions. And, and then, I guess another application could be when you talk about and i guess this, this ties a little bit into the hawk project i think to have uh, smart contracts run off chain right is could it also be used for that yeah similar it's it's the same thing so you basically um say or for two-way pegging you say you know here's a proof that you know some some sequence of transactions was was conducted offline someplace and you know the all of them verified because the program that you're proving to me is the program that checks transactions and just reports you know the final state is that whatever um, that side chain now has a partition of coins along you know this small file or a proof that bitcoin will accept it says you can now um, redeem a coin back in bitcoin because something good happened in a side chain without knowing um, what went on yeah so uh, one one other one other interesting thing that i i see in the literature around cryptocurrencies and zero knowledge proofs is um, like uh, many people say that this technology is is something that is too complicated to be implemented by the normal developer right like like there have been like posts across reddit in ethereum's blog that says that uh, it is it is significantly involved and until you get to the point where a normal programmer can just use this thing and not worry about it just like we use our operating system today and don't think about it uh, it's it's hard to kind of spread this do, do you see that as uh, as another challenge for the technology not in the long run. I mean, you just mentioned operating systems. We're talking over the internet with myriad 
complexities of, you know, networking. And I mean, that's all really complicated. I could never wrap, wrap my head around any of these things. And yet it works seamlessly, right? I open up the computer. I talk to you guys. I have no idea what's going on, you know, vision compression, you name it. So, no, I don't think um, this kind of cryptography is any different. It's advanced technology that just is emerging from, you know, the science labs and it will take some time. But the same thing happened to lasers and rockets and the Internet and computers in general. So why would this be different? The only thing would be if this is not useful, then not enough smart people will try to use it. And then, yeah, we'll, it will rot on the shelves. I really, really hope that's not going to be the case. And then, you know, you'll have a whole industry and people will use it and it's going to be all over the place. That's my hope. Uh, I I I'd say like if 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 we as the blockchain industry survive, <laughs> you will find your use. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean the 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 use is is dependent on us. Uh, what happens to the whole industry that's that's there today? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I th I think it's it it seems necessary, right? If if you look at blockchain, and you look at smart contracts, then it's just like, well, this has to be sort of an integral part of, of the technology stack in the future, right? And it, it's going to be a challenge too, to, to, because the blockchain stuff on its own is a challenge. And then you add that, it, it makes it even more challenging. But uh, you, I think you're totally right. If the incentive is big enough and there's enough at stake and enough interest in it, people will make it happen. Yes, I agree. So, Eli, uh, thanks so much for coming on. That was really enjoyable and super interesting to dive into this topic. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad. I'm glad you feel this. Uh, you've chosen a field that is is have, generating such enormous interest. It chose me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so for those who want to dive a little bit deeper into it, of course, we'll link in the show notes to Ellie's papers. Uh, there's a paper on snarks and also one on zero cash. And I think we'll also be doing a podcast episode on zero cash in the near future with Zuko. Um, and there's also some links to, I think, uh, a talk he gave at the uh, Bitcoin event. And we'll have some other links in there also to his website where you can find the rest of his research papers. So with that, uh, thanks so much for listening. So we're part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. So you can, you can check out lots of great podcasts about cryptocurrencies, blockchain, etc. on letstalkbitcoin.com. And of course, you can get... Uh, Epicenter Bitcoin on any podcast application, or you can watch the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And if you're a loyal listener, if you want to participate, we have this t-shirt contest. If you leave us an iTunes review, you can send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we can send you a t-shirt. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.